Hello. In this video, we're going to be talking about something called a frequency histogram, or since we're going to be looking at lots of them, we're going to be talking about frequency histograms. Frequency histograms are a kind of graph, and you want to be drawing frequency histograms as part of the exploratory part of your data analysis. So when you first get a data set, you might want to draw some frequency histograms to help you understand what the patterns are in, those data, in that data set. And then you can use what you find out in your exploratory analysis to guide you if you start moving on to a more formal kind of statistical analysis. So they're an important way to visualize your data. Um, if you have a variable that you've measured, you can draw a frequency histogram of it. And it's gonna tell you lots of important things about what's going on in those data that you've measured. It's gonna tell you what the shape of the variable is, what the shape of the data are, is, and you'll be able to find out where the middle of the distribution is. Is there a peak in your distribution of data? Is your data distribution asymmetrical or symmetrical? Are there any really extreme values that you might need to worry about and so on? You'll also be able to detect any really problematic data points. Um, if you have a data point that's been measured incorrectly for some reason and is 10,000 times the value of all the other data points, then you're going to see that in the frequency histogram. It's not a foolproof way of detecting problems, but it will show you some of the more serious problems before you have to start dealing with them in your statistical analysis. So here's, here's an example of a frequency histogram, uh, something that you may well be familiar with. Uh, this is the review summary from amazon.co.uk for Star Wars The Phantom Menace. And you can see that at the time I took this screenshot, 583 people had reviewed it. When you review something on Amazon, you only have a choice of one star, two star, three star, four star, or five star. You can't give something 0.2 stars or 4.8 stars or three and a half stars. And what that means is that these data are what we call ordinal. By ordinal data, what I mean is a kind of data where each value can only take one specific kind of value, but those values are then ordered. So you have discrete values, but those discrete values have a sensible order to them. In this case, you can order your values from one star to five star, or if you like, from five star to one star, and that makes sense. So what you can do is you can just count the number of reviews that have five stars, the number that have four stars, and so on. And then you can just draw a graph showing those counts. In this case, the graph says it's showing you percentages, but in fact, it looks exactly the same as it would if we were looking at counts. And you can now look at that and you can see some patterns. So the first thing you can see is that there's a big peak in this distribution at five star. Over half of all the people responding gave Star Wars The Phantom Menace a five star review. If you've seen the movie, um, then you might find that somewhat disturbing. Um, but there is a little bit of hope for humanity in that there is also a second peak. It's not as big as the first peak, unfortunately, but there is a second peak at one star reviews. So more people gave it a one star review than gave it a two star review, for example. So you can look at this frequency histogram and it's gonna tell you interesting things about this movie. And one of the things it's gonna tell you is that opinion seems to be quite polarized on the quality of Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Um, some people really like it, some people really hate it, and there are more people who really like it or really hate it than there are people with kind of intermediate views on the standard of the movie. So that's one really nice, easy, simple example of a frequency histogram. When you're dealing with biological data or data from other branches of the sciences, of course, um, a lot of the time your data don't follow this nice ordered way um, of, of being made that mean you can easily draw frequency histograms. So your data will often not have discrete values, um, but your data will have what we call continuous values, which means that each data point can take any value. You've got decimal places, for example, and those decimal places can take any value. And if you try and draw a frequency histogram in the way we've just described, that becomes problematic because it's likely that for a small data set at least, each individual data point will have its own unique value. So if you count all the data points that have a value of 127.6 and there's only one of them, that's really not telling you very much. So let's look at an example and I'll explain how we deal with this when we're looking at continuous data. So let's say you're doing a study where you're measuring hematocrit levels, that's the amount of solid material in someone's blood, which is mostly going to be made up of red cells. Hematocrits, 
are usually expressed as percentages. So what percentage of the blood is this solid material when you centrifuge it? And let's say you're getting values for your data like this. So 41.2, 43.9, 48.6 and so on. If you've got a set of data like this and you want to look at a frequency histogram, <clears throat> you can first off say, well, what's, what, what's the range of the data? What does it go from and to? So in this case, it ranges from around about 40 to around about 55. And then when you know that range, you can split that range up into a sensible number of sub ranges. And then you can count the number of data points that fall within each of those sub ranges. These sub ranges are called bins. And in this case, we might use bins with values of less than or equal to 40, 40.1 to 42, 42.1 to 44, so on all the way to 54.1 to 56, and then more than 56. And we would count the number of data points that had values that fell into each of those bins. Here's what we might get at the end of this. Uh, we've got all the values for our bins written down the left-hand side here, going all the way from less than or equal to 40 to more than 56. And then down here, we've got the actual counts of data points that correspond to each of those ranges. And you can just look at that and you can obviously see quite a lot of things going on. So at the extreme values, we've only got a few data points, but in the middle of our data set, we've got lots of values. So there's only one data point with a value between 54.1 and 56, but there are 21 data points with values between 48.1 and 50. So now we've got these counts. What we can do is we can draw a frequency histogram of them. This is what it looks like. And you can look at this and you can see lots of important things about this particular variable. So you can look at it and you can see that it has a center to it. There's a concentration of data around about 47. So the most common value is around about 47. And then you can also see that there's a certain degree of spread. Uh, it's not very much. So most of the data here have values between 44 and 50%. Um, but there are a few, a few values which are quite a lot bigger and quite a lot smaller than that. And that gives our distribution what we would call these tails here. So you can look at that and you can see where your data are located on the number line, where the center is. You can see how widely spread they are around that center. And you can see if there are any extreme values, either larger or smaller than the center of your data set. So that's a really useful thing to know. Those of you who've met this kind of thing before will probably have noticed that this frequency histogram here appears to, appears to be following what we would expect if our data were drawn from a normal distribution. You may well have heard of a normal distribution. Um, normal distributions have this characteristic bell-shaped curve and you can pretty much see a bell shape in those data there. So, so what, is, what is a normal distribution? Well, a normal distribution is one that we expect to arise when the thing that we're measuring is determined by a wide variety of different effects, all of which add together to give us the final value. So if you think of height, for example, a person's height is determined by a whole bunch of different genes um, acting together, and then also a whole bunch of different environmental effects that act on them when they're growing. And if those things add together rather than being multiplied together, we'd expect to find that height should have a normal distribution. And in fact, it does have a distribution that's, if not quite normal, is, is very close to normal. So normal distributions arise when we have lots of small effects that add together to give us the thing that we're measuring. Normal distributions give us these symmetrical bell-shaped histograms that you've just seen an example of. Bell-shaped histograms, not histograms. A uh, bit of a spelling error there, I'm sorry. Um, and so when we're looking at our data, we might expect to see these bell-shaped curves quite a lot of the time. I'm just going to put one caveat in here, and that caveat is that whether or not we see a really good representation of the underlying frequency distribution depends a lot on the sample size we have. So these histograms here all show data sets drawn at random from a normal distribution with a mean of zero. Um, they have different size sample sizes. So in the bottom right, you can see a thousand data points, and in the top left, you can see 20, and then top right is 50, and bottom left is 250. 
And what you can see is that you really only see that lovely bell-shaped curve when you've got a very big sample size. When you've got 20 or 50 data points, if you were to draw that and someone said, is the underlying distribution normal? You'd have to say, I really don't know. I can't tell from looking at this frequency distribution. So when you're dealing with small sample sizes, if you get frequency histograms that look like a bit of a mess, like the one for 20 does, um, don't worry too much about that. You need to remember that because your sample size is small, it's very hard to visualize what the underlying frequency distribution is. Okay, so that's our normal distribution with a nice symmetrical bell-shaped curve. Let's look at a couple of examples of them because normal distributions do happen in biology and there are lots of things which are at least pro approximately normally distributed. So here, here are two examples. On the left we have time to knock down at 37 and a half degrees for some Drosophila um, and you can see that that's a nice bell-shaped curve with a decent central tendency. Um, there's a hint that it's slightly positively skewed, so it's extending more towards the right than towards the left, but it's at least approximately normal. And then on the right, we've got data from the World Bank, which is showing us annual population growth per country for 183 countries around the world in 2014. And again, you can see that that's a nice normal distribution there for our frequency histogram. OK, moving on. Let's think about some other kinds of frequency histogram that we might see. While you might be told by some people or you might read in books that uh, normal distributions are the most common ones that we should expect, if you're working with biological data at least and probably lots of other kinds of data, then you're very likely to be coming across skewed distributions as well. Skewed distributions are distributions where one of those tails is longer than the other and where you have extreme values either towards the high end of the data, in which case we would call that positive skew, where there are more large values than you would expect from a normal distribution, or if you have more low values than you would expect from a normal distribution, we would call that negative skew. So we get these skewed distributions that are not symmetrical around the centre of the distribution like the normal distribution is. The things that cause skewed distributions are quite variable, but when we're thinking about the most important things that cause skewed distributions, one of these is when we have effects that multiply together rather than add together. So when we were talking about the normal distribution, I said if you have lots of small effects that add together, you tend to get normally distributed data. If you have lots of small effects that multiply together to give the thing that you're measuring, you would expect to find positive skew in the frequency histogram for that for that variable. Another thing that can cause um, skew in your data is when the data have some kind of boundary to them. So a most common example of this would be when you have data which can't be zip, which can't be negative. Um, if you're measuring things that can't be negative but a lot of them are close to zero then the whole distribution gets kind of squished up against that boundary and you end up with one one side of the distribution that's very, very squashed up against zero, and then the other end of the distribution tends to be a much longer tail, giving you, again, a positively skewed distribution. If there's a high boundary to the data, that can give you a negatively skewed distribution. Negatively skewed distributions are quite rare, but I'll show you one example of that later on. OK, so here are some examples of hypothetical skewed distributions and I'm just showing you these to show you that the degree of skew that you see in a data set can vary quite a lot. So top left we've got some random numbers drawn from a normal distribution and I think there were a thousand of them and you can see that nice normal distribution there with that symmetrical bell curve and then on the right we've got a distribution showing a moderate amount of positive skew and you can see that that shape of that distribution has now changed and you have more large values than you have small values and you have some values that are really quite large in comparison with the most common values in the data set. Then bottom left we have some data with a rather stronger positive skew and you can see that that tail is now a really important part of what's determining the shape of that overall frequency histogram. And then bottom right you've got some really strong positive skew there and you can see that the whole, essentially the whole frequency histogram 
is the long right tail um, heading off to some very, very large numbers indeed that are a very long way from the, from the main central tendency of the data set. So those are some examples of positively skewed data of the kind of thing that you might see. Um, here we've got some examples of actual positively skewed data. Um, these are data from a paper by Berger et al. that was published in the Journal of Mammal Mammalology in 2019. Um, and this paper was looking at relationships between body mass and brain mass in a whole bunch of mammals. Here I'm just showing you the artiodactyls. The artiodactyls are the even-toed ungulates, um, so wildebeest gazelles, sheep, um, are all artiodactyls. Um, and you can see that in the artiodactyl brain data, there's a, there's a reasonable amount of positive skew. So um, most of the artiodactyls have brain masses of around about 100 to 200 grams. But we also have some, we have a few, that have masses in excess of 600 grams. On the right, we've got a similar graph, but for body mass. And you can see that this variable is much more skewed than the variable for brain mass um, and we've got a very strong positive skew on that distribution with a few of these animals weighing over a ton uh, but the great majority of them weighing a hundred kilos or less. So this is an example of a very strongly positively skewed distribution that you might find in nature. Okay I said that negative skew distributions are rare but they do exist Here's one example of a negatively skewed distribution. These data are from a paper by Huey and Pianca. Um, and what you're seeing here is the frequency histogram for body temperature measurements for a lizard living in the desert of Western Australia. And you can see that the body temperature has negative skew. So measurements greater than 40 degrees are very rare, but we've got that long tail going down to about 15 degrees with the occasional value that's a long way below the kind of central tendency of the data set. And when I said before that you can get skew distributions where there's some kind of boundary um, to, um, to, our, to our variable, you can imagine that in this case, uh, if the lizard gets too hot, if it gets over some kind of critical limit, that's gonna be really bad for it. It's gonna be incapacitated, um, it might even die. But we also know that the warmer the lizard is, the more active it's going to be. So the lizard is kind of pushing up against that limit in its behavioural thermoregulation to try and get its temperature to a point where it's really good and active, but where it's not actually in any danger of, um, of becoming in incapacitated. So this, this gives us this kind of negatively skewed distribution. And like I say, these are, these are quite rare, but we do, we do find them occasionally in biology. So that's a negatively skewed distribution as well. Finally, we also sometimes see distributions with more than one peak to them. And we call these, well, if there's two peaks, we would call that a bimodal distribution. Um, the mode is the most common value in a data set. And if there are two, two values that are more common than all the rest, you might call that a bimodal distribution. If you have three peaks, then you would call that a trimodal distribution. And when you see a multimodal distribution, usually it's going to be a bimodal distribution. That's usually telling you that there's something going on in your data that you might not know about. So this is an example uh, from a paper by Fernandez Mirama. Uh, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce that, I'm sorry. If they ever watch this, I apologise for my rudeness in mispronouncing your name. Published in 2017 in the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society. And this is a paper looking at periwinkles on a rocky shore in southwest Spain and the data you're looking at are the heights of the shells of the periwinkles and in fact what we've got here is data from the middle of the shore um, and what it turns out to be is that there are two different ecotypes of this particular species of periwinkle. There are some which are quite large and robust and these live on the upper shore and they, they have to deal with crab predation um, and so they grow large, heavily ridged shells. And then there's also a second ecotype that lives on the lower shore. And these are more adapted to resist wave action than, than to resist crab predation. They don't have such an exposure to predation, but they do have to deal with a lot more wave action. And they're a lot smaller than the upper shore ecotype. And if you were to sample periwinkles just from the upper shore or just from the lower shore, 
you'd find an, a, a unimodal distribution of sizes um, where there was only one peak. But here in the middle of the shore, there's this bimodal distribution because we've got periwinkles of both ecotypes mixing in the middle of the shore here. So you've got a bimodal distribution and there's an interesting reason why we've got that bimodal distribution. So if you see a bimodal distribution in your data, the first thing you should ask yourself is why is there a bimodal distribution? Why are there two groups of data points in my data set? And is there something that's causing that? And at that point, I think we've seen enough frequency histograms. So I'll bid you farewell. Thank you very much for listening.